Hello everyone, I'm Paul with the Garland County Library and we are here with the latest installment of our ongoing author talk series featuring Trisha Goyer this evening and I'm actually going to be passing the torch tonight to Shannon Emmons who is my coworker here at the Garland County Library. She is the adult services assistant making her debut here on our live streams. So welcome Shannon, are you excited? I am. I'm so excited, especially to be interviewing Trisha Goyer. Oh my goodness. Um, so she is a USA Today best-selling author. Of She's published more than 80 books, and she's got so many awards to her name. She's a two-time Carol Award winner, and that award um, celebrates American Christian fiction writers' best traditionally published Christian fiction, published in a calendar year. She's won the Retailer's Best Award. It's been nominated for the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association Gold Medallion, which recognizes outstanding sales achievement of publication of quality Christian literature. She's also nominated for their Christie Award, acknowledging the value and impact of a novel of faith and contemporary culture. And she was named Writer of the Year at the Mount Hermon's Christian Writers Conference. She's a conference speaker at MomCon, Raising Generations, and Teach Them Diligently. And she hosts her own podcast, Walk It Out, where she interviews authors, artists, and musicians when their new releases come out. Um, if you have any questions during the live stream, feel free to post them in our uh, YouTube chat or in our Facebook live chat. We'd be happy to um, get your quest questions to Trisha so she can answer them. So uh, welcome, Trisha. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. It's great to be here. So fun to connect with you. So you've made this really easy for me. We've got a lot of different topics to uh, draw from tonight, but I guess I want to jump in with um, with your fiction writing in particular. So you've got titles out um, in Amish fiction and I do. fiction, so many, so many genres. So how did you get interested in Amish fiction? Well, Amish fiction is super interesting. Before that, I'd been writing World War II. Um, I've been able to interview veterans and travel and do research. And I actually had an editor email me and said, would you be interested in writing Amish fiction? This is when Amish fiction was quickly becoming popular. And at first I laughed. I thought, ha, 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 because, you know, war and Amish are like two completely different things. Um, but then I told her I'd pray about it. And I remembered later that day that I knew a family that was Amish or had been Amish. Our daughters played homeschool basketball together. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And then the next day I was out to coffee with my daughter and Soretta, her friend, walked in. We hadn't seen her in the months and months and months. And I'm like, well, that's kind of random that <laughs> we would happen to see her. And so I said, Soretta, would you be interested or would your family be interested in talking to me and tell me about their experiences being Amish? And she's like, here's their number. And I called and like, we're going to be in town tomorrow. They lived about an hour away. And I, oh. I said, well, come on over. <laughs> and so they came over. They shared their stories about growing up Amish that actually lost two daughters in a horse and buggy and semi-accident and so many stories just poured out of them. And I remember they walked out the door that night. I closed the door and my husband turned to me and he goes, you have to write Amish. Like it was so fascinating. And my first series is inspired by that, but I've gone on to write other series. And I think the appeal of Amish is kind of like similar to Little House on the Prairie. We love the simple lifestyle. We love the wholesome, clean books. And so I've continued to write Amish fiction from Amish in Montana to Amish in Florida to Amish in Ohio and Indiana. So all types of places. Well, I've got a few of your titles here. This was my introduction to your fiction. Okay. You carry these at the library. So this is one of your big sky novels. Yes. Still water. So where is where does this one take place? That's the that's the one that is, was inspired by my friends. Okay. So that's the first one in the Big Sky series. Okay, lovely. And then we've also got part of the Seven Brides for Seven Bachelors yep, series. Okay. So that's a spin-off. So we have three books in the Big Sky series, okay. besides Still Waters, A Long Wooded Pass, and Beyond Hope's Valley. And okay. then I took characters in the area that were like secondary characters, and they got their own stories. Oh, I love that. And I think I think some of the other um, sort of installments in the series are checked out because they circulate so much. Well, that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> this one is part of this is part of the Big Sky series. Yeah, so that's, that's book three. And Marianne's story really co covers all three books. So you're going to need to 
get to book three to find out who she falls in love with. People are like, okay. it's not going to be at the end of book one. <laughs> okay. So you're holding out the, the satisfaction till the end. Yeah. And I got some here that I pulled off my shelf. It's just funny because it's different than the ones you did, which is cool. Um, this is a series set in Florida. And I co-wrote it with an Amish lady named Sherry Gore. Um, and she's a baker in Florida. In Pinecraft, there's an Amish community where the Amish in the winter go to have vacation, which is so funny. So we were able to visit, and they, um, there's there's three books in that series. But really, so during the year, there's about 300 Amish um, that live there. But then during the winter, they have bus Pioneer Trail buses that come down filled with Amish from Pennsylvania, Indiana, Ohio. And so all these different or because they wear different clothes in different parts of the country and they all pile in the bus and they come down to Florida and everyone just relaxes and <clears throat> has picnics and plays volleyball. The youth play volleyball and it's this wonderful little community that's kind of different than most people think of when they think of the Amish. Yeah, absolutely. So just like a vacation. In it, is a vacation. So. it is a vacation and community and they all know each other. They all vacation together. So it's pretty fun that they have this one place that they like to go. That's amazing. So it sounds like you wrote, you were already writing in the World War II fiction genre before you got to Amish. Yes. So then um, how did you get interested in that? Well, when I first started writing fiction, I just wanted to write like sweet Montana romances. We lived in Montana mm -hmm. at the time. I'm like, I don't want to do too much research. I know Montana. This will be easy. <laughs> and then um, before any of those got published, I ended up going with two friends to Europe. They were on bait. They were both on research trips and they invited me to go along. And one friend's like, we're going to find a story here for you. And I'm like, I'm just enjoying like being with you guys and seeing the you know cathedrals and all the different places. Well, the last stop on the last day we were there, I was going to fly out the next day. We went to a concentration camp. And I thought, this is not where I want to be. It's going to be so depressing. But the stories I heard about the men from the 11th Armored Division liberating the camp and um, mm -hmm. so many people were, the gates were open and they were freed and the Germans actually surrendered. And um, the, the first book has a Nazi officer's wife who hadn't liked what happened. And she ended up going and taking care of the people inside the camp and it's all based on a true story and i just remember standing there i'm like this would be such an amazing novel and i went home and um was able to contact the division and they invited me to their reunions this was back in 2000 so i was able to go and interview some of those world war ii veterans and so really i mean for someone who wasn't interested in doing a lot of research i loved interviewing the veterans and hearing their stories i ended up going to three different reunions and talking to them um they just became all my grandpas and then those became um, my world war ii books and i have i'm trying to think how many maybe 15 World War II novels. Um, my first one, this is the, my first one. It's a new cover than the originally published one, but okay. From Death to the Ashes is the first one. And I've interviewed veterans from Europe, but also the South Pacific or theater too. So right. Right. lots of lots of time talking to those sweet guys. Well, and it's funny you say you didn't want to do any research because online, like all your reviews talk about your attention to detail. I know. <laughs> At some point you must have fallen in love with it. I did. I absolutely did fall in love with it. And I think sometimes um, you just think like, oh, it's going to be too hard and you have to figure out like what the dates and stuff. And once I started in getting into it, once I started talking to the veterans and hearing their experiences and like his, this story would match with this other story. And then I just fell in love with it. And now I really try it. I think because I knew the guys, I really wanted to honor them. So like if a bomb fell in my book, it really fell in that place at that time. I'm not just going to make up random bombing raids or whatever. I mean, I really wanted to be true to history. And I, I really appreciate it now um, that I had that time and that those veterans shared with me because most of them have passed away. And so I feel like it's a way to capture the history um, in a way that people will just get caught up in the story and not realize they're learning, but actually they learn as they read Right. And I, I would think that since you've actually spoken to these people, that would lend a sensitivity that would be impossible to have otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And there's little details like um, after they liberated the concentration camp, they're trying to find food and supplies. And there's actually like a boat docked on the Danube River, which is right next to the concentration camp. And they were able to go and get food and supplies off of it. And it was also carrying a whole bunch of accordions. 
who knows why it was carrying accordions, <laughs> but it's a detail like that that's so random. Um, and then, you know, so I had the guys read the books before they were published and like, you even got the accordions right. Like they were so excited. Mm -hmm. So it's those details that, um, you know, you're not going to get off the History Channel or those types of things right. that, that I really like putting in. So do you feel then that when you're doing the research, it actually helps your writing process to move along? Like, are you getting inspiration and along with the ideas? Oh, absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, one book I'll be researching for one story and then mm -hmm. I'll hear something that becomes my next story. So, okay. for example, I was researching for From Dust and Ashes, this first one talking about the liberation. And um, one of the man, men, he was a medic, and he said when they opened the gates, there was an orchestra of prisoners playing our national anthem because um, they had hoped the Americans would be coming. And they had been because uh, they're they're very famous musicians that were Jewish um, that were put inside the concentration camps. And that just fascinated me. That didn't have room to fit in the book, mm -hmm. my first book. But so my second book, Night Song, became all about the orchestra of prisoners because I'm thinking these are world renowned musicians but because they're jewish they're inside the mm -hmm. concentration camps and then that just again built that story and and so these little things as i'm talking and interviewing people it led to another story and then i was interviewing at a different reunion for that book the night song one mm -hmm. um talking to the guys and one man came up to me he goes i'm here with my cousin um i wasn't in europe i was actually um in the philippines and i was in the Bataan mm -hmm. death march would you write my story and I'm like, yes, and I knew nothing. Like, I was still getting into Europe, but the fact that someone wanted to share his story and that became um, uh, Dawn of a Thousand Nights and many people that know the Philippines was bombed only eight hours after Pearl Harbor. And those men were okay. st stuck there and prisoners of the Japanese. And so, again, it's like I get research or talking to someone and it leads to the next story. So I have so many ideas, so many books um, in my mind that's, you know, and it's just figuring out the time to work on the next one and which one kind of rises to the top to work on next. Yeah, in, in studying writing, I've heard professors talk about this process of accumulation and mm -hmm. just like you have all these tiny little pieces floating out there and you have to see which ones are going to glue themselves together. Absolutely. So. And, and yeah, and really it is, um, I mean, prayerfully just saying, what should I work on? And probably three years ago, four years ago now, I remembered the story of a, a man, and this is a true story, who was put on a train as a child from Czechoslovakia, and he was sent, um, they had trains of children that were sent to England and Scotland so that they would not be um, sent to concentration camps, and I just felt this urge, like, I need to contact him. Like, I had heard about him, someone had given me his number, and he lived in the United States, um, and I had lost it, and so I just felt like, I need to reach out to him, and I did. And he's like, I've been waiting for you to call me, like not me personally, but he was waiting for someone to help him write his story. And I worked with his name is Thomas Grauman, and I worked with him for about a year getting his story. Um, and I, I, we got a publisher. Our publisher was in London, actually. And um, I just said, they said, well, we'll get this out, you know, in a year. And I said, I really feel we need to just get this out quickly, like as soon as we can. And so I fast tracked everything and they fast tracked everything. And so it came out. Um, in 2020, um, in December, and he passed away in March in oh, 2021. So I just feel like those feelings like, I need to write this story. This is super important. I didn't realize how important it was that I, I you know, if I would have just like, oh, yeah, I'll talk to him later, or yeah, you know, I have other stuff to do, that, that story would have never gotten written. And it was an amazing story. And he went back afterwards after, um, you know, Czechoslovakia, the Iron Curtain fell, and he was able to uh, meet his childhood friends, and he met the son of the priest who had saved his life and got him on that train. So it's just neat that story came full, full circle, and I was able to talk to Thomas and, and get that in print, I mean, literally months before he passed away. Well, you mentioned a few times sort of um, that prayer is a part of your writing process. Mm -hmm. And I know faith is sort of the underlying theme in all of your books. Do you want to talk a little bit about how your faith interacts with your writing? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, because I'm a Christian and I have this strong faith, of course, it's going to come out. And my characters, I think the whether we like to think it or not, like pieces of us come out in every single book because that's just our worldview and how we think of things. And so really... Um, you know, most 
novelists always have, you know, you have your characters and you have your plot Mm -hmm. and you have your theme and all those things I figure out and I work on. But also I think the spiritual thread is so important in my books. So it might be, um, so for, for example, from Dust and Ashes, it's a story of liberation. And so spiritually, um, the Nazi officer's wife had to discover forgiveness, even though, because she was able to, to help those people and, and receive their forgiveness. So in the story, she's liberated by the pain and shame of her past. Or, um, you know, so each of my books, even though they have definitely like the conflict, the plots, all those things, that spiritual thread just winds through everyone. And um, I think it's important for me to have that. But so many times I get letters or emails like, I was at a hope, but now I have hope. Or you've given me faith through this novel, which I think is just amazing that, you know, within the pages of a novel, someone can get hope or faith or discover this little thread of truth that they needed just at that time. So I think there's that extra element that is found in Christian fiction. And many people may not even realize, like, there's whole publishing houses that just publish Christian fiction. So Christian themes within these books. And um, I write mostly for those, but I've also written for other publishing houses that um, accept that, but it's not in every one of their books. So that we might not see like every one of their books have that spiritual theme, but they're open to it in some of their books. So um, I'm just thankful that I'm able to do that with all the publishers that I work with. Yeah. And you've worked with quite a few different groups Mm -hmm. uh, from, from what it looks like. Well, so another theme that really seems to underlie everything that you put out is strong women, mm-hmm. strong women struggling against sometimes really extraordinary circumstances. So how did you come to that sort of a, a central theme for your writing career for each of your books? Yeah, and I, I think it was something that I realized like after I'd written like seven and eight books that, oh, this is a theme. <laughs> it wasn't like I started out, um, I'm gonna write about these strong women, but I think as I went along, and I had these books published and like people like, oh, all your characters seem like they start out so ordinary and then they have to find that strength within them. And so I think it just came out of um, as I continue to write stories. And part of it is my own questions of who am I to write these novels? Like I'm a mom of little, I started with have little, little kids. Um, my oldest was uh five when i went to my first writers conference and i was pregnant with my third so i was this young young mom like i'm gonna write these books and so i think part of it is like okay ordinary people can do pretty cool things and extraordinary things and so i think part of that was kind of like me realizing like it doesn't matter who we are we can be completely ordinary but sometimes we'll be called to do hard things and we can't achieve them and so that's been part of my life i've been you know we've um, we have 10 kids. We've adopted seven kids. Um, you know, I write with all the kids at home. I homeschool. So part of it is like, as I'm figuring out my inner strength, that kind of goes into every one of the characters that I have. So I'm finding it amazing that you get so much accomplished every day um, in all these different areas of your life. So you said you have 10 kids. So am yes. I right? You have five at home and five out of the home. Oh, my goodness. So it's so funny that like, oh, we only have five kids at home now. It's easier than it used to be. So uh, yeah, and at one time I was home, homeschooling seven kids. So a couple of those kids have, um, you know, they're adults now and they're out of the house. So, you know, before that I had the three kids that I raised almost to adulthood and then we adopted kids. So um, yeah, it's just, I think I've always had kids at home when I'm writing. So it's kind of either writing before they get up or in the afternoon after homeschools or sometimes in the evening. It's just trying to figure out where to fit that in into a very ordinary life. So, you know, our family, we homeschooled for about 10 years. And then once my third child got old enough to really get involved, I thought, okay, three, I I need some help. Yeah. (laughs) But you had seven going at the same time. Uh, what is your what's your homeschooling approach like what's your motivation to to go there and how do you orchestrate your day yeah um so with my older kids they were very independent and they did most of their works on computers and so literally with my three oldest who are now adults they would i would be working on my books and they'd be working on their homeschool and it worked for us. They were able to learn and move on. Once we adopted kids, it got harder um, because a lot of them were special needs. Three of them were dyslexic. We have some ADHD kids there. And so really my approach was to do as many subjects 
as possible with them all together. And so at one time we had from first grade all the way to a sophomore and I would do a lot of read out louds. And of course, because I love reading and books, a lot of historical fiction. So, you know, we read through like the Little House on the Prairie books and we read through, I mean, just uh, Caddy Woodlong and, you know, all these wonderful books that they're learning so much about history. They're learning about, you know, different time periods. They're learning all these things through the pages of a novel. And so my husband laughed because he works from home and he'd come down and I'd be reading out loud from these great books. And, you know, of course, then we go on the rabbit trails. Like we did one book um, by the great spoon bill and it was on the gold rush. So all of a sudden we're watching videos on the gold rush or we're, you know, going in the back and digging up dirt and seeing what minerals are there. I mean, we kind of go on rabbit trails, but he came downstairs when I'm reading out loud and like one kid would be painting, one kid would be doing Legos, one kid would be doing beads and all this stuff, but they're listening because, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I found when their, their hands are moving, they're still able to listen. And so it may have looked like chaos, but they were all listening and they were all learning, especially the kids that were dyslexic that cannot mm-hmm. read at that level. They were, they were hearing stories. Um, and it was amazing because our, our older kids that we adopted, we adopted some that were 11, 13, and 13, and 15. When we adopted them, just bringing them home and having that time of reading, it was amazing to see their standardized testing scores, especially in yes. literature, just just skyrocket. And so really, I and I've tell people like, I don't have the money to homeschool. And so I'm going to put a plug here. Like if you have a library, and you can read out loud, like you can teach your kids anything. And so many books that we'd have, like, again, we go on these rabbit trails, we get a basic novel and then go on the rabbit trail and get the nonfiction books that go on the same subject or the YouTube channel or different audio books. And they just learned and learned and learned. And then of course, each one of them had their math subject, their spelling words, like those, the writing that's different. But I would say three quarters, I could do it all together with all of them. Or I'd have my older girls read out loud. So they get a chance to read. And really, it's amazing um, how much you can accomplish even with a group. And you think about it like a one school run room schoolhouse. Right. That's basically what they had. Like everyone was in there together. So we just kind of had a one room schoolhouse in our dining room. Yeah, we definitely took a reading based approach as well. Yes. Um, here at Garland County Library, we have a huge, vibrant uh, homeschool community. And, you know, and I see I see lots of folks. They'll take a novel and then build. They'll, mm-hmm. they'll get their nonfiction, you know, books around the same subject. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. how much kids learn and don't even realize yeah. it. They're just having fun and they love books and they love stories. So, yeah, and, and also this is an approach that somebody could take with their kids in school, just doing this. In the Absolutely. Yeah. So it's Find out what your kids are interested in and just go from there. Absolutely. So you're you're I'm picturing you now. You're writing at the table with your kids learning around you that was my big ones yeah i did not was not able to do that when i had seven kids at one time yeah. now my understanding is that your your three oldest are also writers or storytellers yes um, i've got your your i guess nathan nathan's your second son nathan's my third well yes my second son my third child yeah okay so i've got his book and i know your oldest has some poetry out mm-hmm. we're very proud of him we're just um, talking about, yeah <laughs> And he writes a lot. We just, he just, we got to work on getting the whole book finished. So, and that was the fun thing about homeschooling is we did writing, we did creative writing. I dragged them along when I did like homeschool writing classes, they had to come along and write. And so, yeah, Corey's very, he's my oldest. He's very, he's a very good writer. Um, And he's written poetry. He's written um, parts of novels all over the place. Um, He's my oldest. My second one, she lives in the Czech Republic and she actually teaches at a university there. She teaches writing at a university um, in English to to upper level classmen, which is so funny. When she started, she was basically the same age as some of the students that were in her class. And she's um, a very good writer also. And then my third oldest, uh, Nathan, has his book published, which is called Basque. Um, and he has lots of writing projects that he's working on. I've gone to some writers, writers conferences with him. So it's fun. And I think part of it 
was it was was a natural part of our world yeah. they saw me writing we read out loud they worked on stuff they went to the writing workshops but they were with me when i interviewed world war ii veterans they've been to librarian conventions with me when i'm signing books they've been able to be there and our book conventions they've been there when we got on research trips um they've been along and they've got to see me like experience things and interview people and so they for them writing is like oh yeah i could write a book or oh i have an idea <laughs> so it's not unusual um it's very common for them and so it's fun to see how that has kind of blossomed in each one of their lives too it sounds like they picked it up almost by osmosis but also just seeing the process uh, yeah and absolutely we uh, my husband read aloud a mm -hmm. lot to them so before bed we read like through the chronicles of narnia and the hobbit the lord of the rings books and um, some some of the frank pretty children's series mm -hmm. um sigmund brower has wonderful medieval series for kids and so while i was homeschooling today my husband mm -hmm. would read at night and you know even as they're teenagers we get the phone calls when they're at work or basketball practice like don't start reading until i get home <laughs> and they're like teenagers um and so and we would talk about plot and characters and what do you think's going to happen and so even now whether they go see a movie or they read the same book they i will hear them and it's so fun like to hear especially my adult kids talking about plot or characters or yeah. this or that or arc story arc and i'm like okay this is really cool but it was very much a natural part of our vocabulary in our home and it's cool to see that they kind of pick that up and it's just natural to them it, it feels like you know um when you don't grow up in a writing home like that you can really either way underestimate the work that goes into a book or way overestimate it as opposed to seeing you know this is it's like a job it's a process it's a job mm -hmm. and it's a process and um they saw mom like plugging away at the book and then look, book showed up in the mail. Yeah. yeah. So um, what is your process like during the day? So you, you wake up and how do you get started? Yeah, my day always starts with spending time with my Bible and my prayer journal and really just getting settled. I think with so much going on in the world, it's easy to have our mind distracted and worried about a lot of things. And that really just helps me get settled. And then I usually have time before they wake up because I wake up early, a lot earlier than them to I'll, I answer emails or if I have to edit something or, you know, I usually have an hour, hour and a half in the morning before they start waking up to like my brain is completely focused and no one's distracting me and I could get some stuff done. Um, then they start waking up. And that's when I shower and dress and we have breakfast and we homeschool. So, and I really make sure my homeschooling time is only my homeschooling time. So uh -huh. I don't answer the phone. I'm not, you know, tr trying to do laundry or anything. We are at the table. We are working on stuff. You know, we'll take breaks here and there, but really from about nine o'clock or 9.30 till about one o'clock, that's our time when we get all our work mm -hmm. done, which is nice because there's no homework. Like when we're done, we're done. There's not, not homework in the evening. And then in the afternoon after lunch, that's when I'll, um, I have interviewed people for my podcast or, you know, work on other stuff, work on emails. Um, if I'm in, you know, connecting with someone for research, I'll talk to them during that time. So the afternoon time is kind of my, I don't get as much concentration because there's mm -hmm. still kids going <laughs> in and out of the yeah. house and the phone rings and all those things. So it's more things that don't need quite as much concentration. Um, and then I always make dinner. And then we have dinner together in the evenings. And then our evening time is we'll go for family walks or play board games. We love, my, I love playing board games, especially with my older boys. We get these very complicated board games with all these pieces and have a blast with it. Or sometimes I'll watercolor paint and pull those out just to relax in the evening. We'll watch a show together. So it's this natural rhythm that just seems to work. Um, unless I'm getting close to deadline, then it's like, order pizza and I'm going to be in this room for eight hours straight yes. and your homeschool today is to watch a musical. So here you go. So there will be those random days. So then do you, do you shoot for a certain amount of writing in that morning time? Are you, are you looking for a word count? Are you looking for a page count or? Um, yeah, really in that morning time, it's just whatever comes out. Usually because I have that focus time, mm -hmm. I could get a lot more, Done. Like I could probably write most of an article if I'm doing a magazine article. Okay. I could write a blog post and post for my newsletter. Like during that time, because I just just quiet and my brain is fresh, I could plug away at little things. When I'm under book deadline, so I'm getting ready to start my next novel, and mm -hmm. I will give myself say I have to write 
1500 words a day. Um, you know, of course I'll miss some days. So by the end, I might need to write like 3000 or 4000 words a day. But if I give myself that and I know like, oh, okay, I got my 1500 words in, maybe I get it in the morning, maybe I get half in the morning, half in the afternoon, maybe yeah. I'm still having a couple hundred words to do in the evening. I just know that when I have a novel and I know how many words it has to be, it that just helps me to plug away at it um, mm -hmm. so that I could always keep working on it. And there's some days I don't feel like working. Sure. Most days I love it. Most days I'm so excited about it. But some days I'm like, I just want to go watch a TV show, <laughs> and eat some popcorn and just, you know, just relax. But that daily having that daily progress really, mm -hmm. really helps me to be able to, that's why I'm able to write, you know, two or three or sometimes four books a year. Cause I know when my deadline is and I know how much I need to get done until that deadline and just plugging away a little bit every day really pays off at the end of the year. Wow. So it's interesting to hear you say like even just a hundred word segment, you know, that you set aside time for that and get it done in the evening. Cause it's what the half page. Right. Page. So. Yeah, and some it is, and it really is just like those fringe hours, those fringe minutes. Sometimes I'm cooking dinner, and I get an idea, and I'm like, okay, I'm sick in the seven. I have 20 minutes, and I'm just gonna go run in here real quick and just get the three paragraphs down that will I needed to know what the character's motive is or whatever, and it just came to me. So I'm gonna right. run in there real quick. And so sometimes it's like those little bits and pieces. And the cool thing is, when I'm working on a book like daily. I don't try to work on Sundays. I really try to rest on Sundays because the whole my whole life is busy. Yeah, but those, <laughs> those daily, like keeping my mind on the, like one book, mm -hmm. uh, my mind keeps working. So when I'm in the shower, when I'm driving, it's like sometimes I send myself vo voice notes. Okay, yeah. and like with a piece of dialogue or something. So I found when I keep working on something, the same project daily, um, it really helps my brain keep working. I really encourage people when they want to write, even if you can do 30 minutes a day, that's better than trying to like get away for a weekend or mm -hmm. like feeling like on Saturdays you have to work for eight hours. I think it really just, your brain will kick into, this is how we work and this is what we're gonna do. And so it keeps feeding me ideas, um, even in the midst of very ordinary stuff. So then do you have do you have dialogue appearing while you're actually having a conversation with somebody else? Does it does it cross over sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> sometimes the kids will be saying something and I realize they're talking to me like, wait, I'm in 1897 right now or whatever. <laughs> like, give me a second, I need to finish this thought, and then okay, what were you saying? So yeah, sometimes very much or song will have a, a just a phrase. I'm like, oh, and it'll make me think of something. So yeah, very much it's like I am not in this world right now I'm someplace else and then do you structure how you snag that I know like you said if you're driving maybe it, it'll be a voice message to yourself an yeah. audio file do you have like a notebook that you keep in your pocket or I don't like my best thing that I do is email things to myself okay um so I'll actually open up on my phone and an email and I've tried like different note keeps and all this stuff but I found the email works the best so I'll just open up an email and push the voice recorder mm -hmm. um, and it types it in and I'll just talk and it types it and then I'll just send it to me and it's an easy way and then the next day I'll take those pieces and plug them in where they need to go or I have a file of just like extra thoughts that this is something I need to remember so um, I know lots of authors have different programs where they have this page for notes and this page for uh, no I'm like email I just email it to me and I know to search my email for my notes very cool. Well, I'm going to change directions just a little bit. I wanted to go back and ask. So you said you had 10 kids all together, mm -hmm. uh, three biological children, and then you adopted seven. So how did you start that journey? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so when our youngest was about, well, when he was probably about 10, I was interested in adoption. John was mm -hmm. not. He's like, we have busy lives. And as he got a little bit older, John realized, like, hey, we're still young. Like, we can take on more kids. These these first three are turning up okay. Yeah. So um, we uh, first adopted from a private adoption. Um, Alyssa's 11 now, so 11 years ago. And it was right at the time we moved from Montana to Arkansas. So let's talk about life change. We had three older kids, and suddenly we're moving from Montana to Arkansas and yeah. adopting a baby. So that was a big life change. And then once we got here, um, we just noticed like Project Zero and 
um, different organizations like would post photos of kids. And I'm like, what is this? There's like so many kids in foster care that need homes. And I, I never really thought about that before in Montana. It was a very rural community community we lived in. And so I think being in Little Rock and now I'm in Bryant, but being in this area, I was just aware kind of of the needs of kids in foster care. And John and I talked about it. And we had this little baby we we're raising and we're like, she's going to be completely spoiled rotten. <laughs> you know? So we first adopted a sibling group of a two-year-old and a five-year-old. And then later we adopted a sibling group of four girls. Um, they were 11, 13, 13, and 15. There's twins in there. Um, cause we realized like sibling groups, it's really hard to find homes for them too. And we just prayed about it. So we went from, you know, three kids almost out of the house to within five years, seven kids. <laughs> so it's busy. It's crazy. Um, there's been ups and downs, but I mean, really this is, they're just as much as our kids as our older kids are. And, um, it's neat to see the relationships, even with our adult kids with our younger ones. I mean, they're still siblings and it's fun to see like my older boys wrestling with my 11 year old and slamming him down the ground. And I have grandkids that are almost the ages of my younger kids. And so they're just friends and they just love spending time together. So it's neat to see how this family has been built from all these random places, but we're totally, totally a family. So it's, um, it's something that I'm thankful we did, even though it's very hard some days. <laughs> Well, it sounds like your days are very full, but in a beautiful way. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've talked about your fiction. Mm -hmm. I wanted to bridge over and talk about your nonfiction because you have books out on parenting and faith and marriage and prayer. And um, in fact, I think your most recent release um, was this your children's book? Yes. Yeah, so my children's book, I have it right here, and it's called The Grumbles. And I have a nonfiction book called The Grumble Free Year, which after adopting these kids, we really tried to work on not grumbling in our house, which we have our successes and our failures <laughs> inside right. that book. Right. Um, but then from that, my, one of my good friends is Amy Parker, and she writes a lot of children's books, New York Times bestselling children's book author. And I was being interviewed on her podcast, and I was saying something about the grumbles, are the grumbles in your house or something? She's like, oh, that would be a great book. And her and I like literally in one day just texting back and forth like it's probably in our text messages the whole book we would just write stuff back and forth and that's how this book um came to be and the illustrators in spain so the publisher running kids press sent us like these different samples from three different ones and we both fell in love with her illustrations and she just did a beautiful job like capturing their emotions and all the things that goes behind grumbling so um, it was super fun to see kind of the children's book, you know, grow out of just that interview on that podcast. That is beautiful. So then your grumble free year, it does that just sort of catalog. I mean, I guess in a story way, your experiences. Yes. Very. It's so it's like, um, what are those called? Not a, it's a self-help book. Like, so it gives encouragement to other people and mm -hmm. gives ideas to them. A social experiment. That's what it's called. Right. <laughs> so it's right. A social experiment. Let's see if we can go with without grumbling for a year, which we knew we couldn't go without grumbling, right. but really try right. to work on being thankful and grateful instead of grumbling. And, and we did the, the, the year was from 2017 to 2018 when we, you know, and I would, let's try this. Let's try memorizing this first. Let's read about the grumbling Israelites in the Bible. Let's talk about reaching out to our neighbors and serving other people instead of just thinking of ourselves. So we worked on different things and it, it was during that year we really saw, I mean, at the beginning, I'm like, this is not working. But as I learned to apologize when I grumbled, when I learned to praise my kids more, instead of just, you know, uh, talking negative about you didn't do this right or pick up this. When I started, when I started changing, I realized like, Oh, they started changing too. And I'm so thankful we worked on it because our, grumbling has really decreased since when we first started and that really helped in 2020 when we're all in the house yes. <laughs> all together I'm like I'm so thankful we worked on this grumbling thing because we it taught us like we learned how to not focus on all the negative all the time but really find 
ways to be thankful even during the hard stuff. And so I think that training for a year, working on it, working on it, and trying to have better attitudes and encouraging each other and apologizing really paid off when we were suddenly all stuck in the house for months without leaving. So it made a big difference. Sounds like we all need to read both of those books. So yeah. Um, so then you you have I know some resources out for for children and for teens as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your nonfiction? Yeah, I got some right here that I pulled. So um, this is one that I did with um, this is for parents for with Ken Blanchard, okay. who he's the one minute manager guy, but mm -hmm. very well known. Um, he has an organization called Lead Like Jesus. And so they pulled me in to do the family version of that. Um, I have a book for kids called Prayers That Change History. And okay. so just being a homeschooling mom, I'd find all these amazing times in history when someone prayed and things changed. And then um, I thought I grabbed one. I have a book for teen girls called Praying for Your Future Husband. Okay. Um, so that book, we get a lot of letters from young women and just encourages them to um, not only pray that God will bring the perfect Prince Charming, but really look at themselves and things they might need to change. And so, um, it, and, and all these things stem from either wanting a resource for my kids or I worked with teen moms for yeah. many years and volunteered. So I can see like, oh, there's a need for this or and I have another nonfiction book um, for homeschoolers that I did with my friend, Christy Clover on homeschooling is like the very basics you need about homeschooling. And so as we talk to people, as I work with my kids, as I work with teen moms, as I, you know, whatever, we're dealing with grumbling um, in our lives, those kind of just make their way into books because people are like, what do you do about that? Or how do you homeschool or all these things? And so it's easier for me just to write it out <laughs> and then right. I, can, I can help people with it. Yeah, the book that you're looking for doesn't exist. So you exactly, write it. Yeah. yes. And especially like this, the prayers that changed history, I'm like, someone needs to write a book with all these prayers in it because they're really cool. And pretty soon I had a file in my filing cabinet and I would just collect stories, like photocopy. If I found a page in a book and put it in there, pretty soon I'm like, okay, this is a book. Like I just need to write it myself. Absolutely. So you've mentioned a few times um, sort of your heart for teen moms. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that you started or co-founded co a ministry in Montana. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. That hope pregnancy ministry. Yeah, hope pregnancy mm -hmm. ministries. We started in Montana, and I was a teen mom. I had my oldest son Corey when I was 17. Then I met and married John later, and so uh, yeah, my heart is just for those young moms that think you know my life is over, and I'm not going to be able to do anything with my life, and I'm just going to be a mom. Um, I just love like yeah, no, you can finish school, or you can follow your dreams, or you can get that job you want, or um, and so because I was a teen mom, and so many older women uh, that my mom knew and my grandma knew just really rallied around me. I just love being that encouragement to young moms and let them know um, that they can make a difference and they can do great things, which is so fun. So our first teen mom support group that I started in Montana was in 2002. And those mamas that were 15, 16, 17 years old mm -hmm. in that group now have kids that are 15, 16, and 17 years old. And so, you know, um, one of the young moms, when we moved to Arkansas, she moved to Arkansas with her kids. And so she's very much a part of her life. So it's almost like an extra adopted kid there. But her daughter's 19 and just graduated. So it's I knew her since she was 15 and her baby was two weeks old. And it's cool to see over time these relationships have built into friendships. And I've been able to see and encourage them. And even now I'll get like, can you pray for me? I mean, these are girls I knew from, you know, 2002. Um, so it's neat to see that that it's just important for people to have someone to speak into their lives and say, you matter, you can make a difference. Um, you know, you can be a good mom, even though you're young. And so I just like to be that voice for them. Yes, well, and I've, I've written a book for them, too, called Teen Mom. <laughs> so... Well, your book has been ongoing. I know that your, your mops group hasn't been able to meet because of the pandemic. Yeah. Something you were doing here in Arkansas. Yeah. I and, love and to Little Rock. Yeah. Yeah. I love to hear you say, you know, they're saying, I'm just a mom. And it's almost like, hold my tea, you know, and you've got these <laughs> angels in the podcast and everything. So, yeah. Um, wow. Well, so I guess I want to ask you, we talked about your most recent book, but you have a book coming out actually in a few months, don't you? 
Yes. In April. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Yeah. So my new book coming out is called Heart Happy. Okay. Um, and it's with Salem Publishing. And it's all about how to just be centered in God during chaotic circumstances. And, you know, I wrote the book. I was actually contracted to write a book about hospitality and like reaching out to your neighbor and inviting people okay. into your home. And then the pandemic hit and I called the publisher and I'm like, um, we can't have anyone over. I can't go anywhere. Like this book on hospitality is not the one I'm going to be writing right now. And like, we even like at first, cause you know, everyone thought it was going to last like two weeks and we'd be able to get back to normal. No idea. So yeah, we were baking cookies and we were putting them on the neighbor's doorsteps. And like, we got this one text message, like, thank you for the cookies, but I couldn't eat them because of COVID. I'm like, what? Like uh, people just didn't know, like when sure, yeah. first started, it was funny. Um, but so I'm like, well, everyone's in chaotic circumstances. So how can we find that happiness in our heart? Um, and, and really, so it goes through, um, you know, just surrendering and our expectations and finding joy and all these things within the book. And it's kind of our story. And then also even like dealing with some of the trauma that came from adopting kids from hard, hard places. So I really talk about like, how can you still find that happiness and find that joy inside when, you know, you have, you have chaotic circumstances even within your family and so that book i'm just hoping will give a lot of people encouragement well and where can people find heart happy yeah Is heart happy's happy? yeah available um in fact i heard barnes and nobles having a pre-order special right now <laughs> so i think it's 25 percent off if you pre-order but any place online amazon and barnes and noble and um any of those places you can get it. And then my website will have it soon to um, trishagoyer.com. I have a web shop and I, I ship books out of my dining room. My 11 year old packages them up. I sign them. So um, during the pandemic, I was supposed to be speaking a lot of homeschool conferences. I'm like, my garage is full of books. <laughs> like if anyone wants to order them, we will mail them to you. So that's kind of how my web shop got going too. Okay, and that's part of your website. Yeah, it's part of my website. Just a shop up there, and you click on that, and it has a little store that they can order stuff. That's perfect. So then can your can your fans also follow you online? Are there places? Absolutely. So um, on Facebook, if they search for Trisha Goyer, they okay. can, it's, they'll find it on Instagram, um, Pinterest. I repost a lot of things on Pinterest, and then my website is just okay. trishagoyer.com. So pretty much if you put my name in there, it's going to come up with all types of stuff. In fact, it's so funny because one of my daughters, um, she had to do a school project. She's 18. She's a senior at Bryant. Um, so she's one I'm not homeschooling right now, but she's she's good to go over there. But it's so funny. She needed to do a project um, like about her family for a presentation. She's like, mom, I just Googled her name. All our photos are online. <laughs> so I was able to just download them for our presentation. I'm like, oh, good. Glad you could find everything you needed uh, just by Googling our names. <laughs> it sounds like she's chill with that. How do they all feel in general? I mean, their lives are a little more public. Yes. And, and it's it, the funny thing is like when we go to a big convention, like one time, um like the exhibitors area was closed and they needed to get in there and the people just opened the door and like oh yeah trisha's kids go in and they're like how do they know us you know we're in like uh i think where were we at nashville or something like that and they're like and i'm like you gotta realize <laughs> like, yeah. you know i talk about you guys um in the books i do use i don't use their real names mm -hmm. and so i'll use like buddy or sissy or other names and so later if they don't want their name out there um but usually, and with my kids that are now adults, every time I would write like a magazine article, I'm like, can I share this story? And there's times they said no. They didn't want me to share about that. And I'm like, okay. Um, with my books, I had them, especially like Grumble for a year, I'd have them read it ahead of time. Because, you know, we talks about us grumbling and everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's good. They were, they were fine with it. So I'm like, okay, this is your chance. Like, yes. if you don't want these stories out there. Um, but also, they love saying, oh, my mom's a writer or... Google my mom, you know, so some of them just think it's really cool. And some of them are like, whatever, I don't care that she's a writer. What time is dinner? Like they, yeah. they don't really care. Well, so then we talked about um, your process. We talked about your day and sort of how you organize all of that. And we talked about your process with fiction. Is your process for your nonfiction 
a lot different or do you still sort of use that accumulation? Is your brain going on it when you're not right in front of the screen? It's the same in that way, definitely, that like the accumulation. And I will know like for a book, um, okay, so I did one called Calming Angry Kids because okay. we had kids with anger issues. And so I would have like think about the toddlers and how we dealt with the anger or things that the therapist taught me of how to deal with teenagers that are angry or how to learn to calm myself. And so kind of when I'm doing nonfiction, it's the same type of thing like plot. I mostly like, of course, have to follow the storyline. But when I'm doing a nonfiction, I'm like, well, this story would go here and this story would go here. And I kind of figure out what chapters I have ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And then I just start plugging in if there's a good quote or something I know that will be helpful that I've learned, I'll plug it in. And pretty soon when I actually sit down to write, I have chunks of this, you know, insert this story, insert this illustration, insert mm -hmm. this quote. And so then it makes it easier because it's all there. Um, and I think instead of just like starting opening a document with a blank page and like, okay, now I need to be brilliant. <laughs> um, I don't really do that. And I'll even do that in research for my fiction. Okay. If I know like, a veteran told me about what it was like when they got to the concentration camp and he will describe things. I'll transcribe that and put maybe some of those descriptions in a later part where I know I'll use it later. And so, especially like settings and different mm -hmm. descriptions, um, I will kind of put those in there. So when I know get to the scene with the concentration camp, I have descriptions and if I've been there or I've experienced things, it's already there. And so I think it's so much easier when we do that, when we take the things we know already and then mm -hmm. write around them, it's so much easier than just sitting down and staring at a blank page and like, where am I supposed to go for here? And so, um, yeah, kind of just pulls all things together and then weave it together into books, which just sounds like, I mean, it's harder. <laughs> it's it's not always that easy. Yeah. And then you send it into the editor and they're like, cut this chapter, add in another story here, you know, then they add their own thing to it. So then you're working with different publishers. Do they, are there things that are sort of the same across the board or does everybody have a different approach, you know, with your work? And you have Yeah, to I would say generally it's about the same. Okay. Um, so generally, um, you know, I have, a, I have an agent that I've worked with since 1997 and she's the one that submits my ideas to publishers. Um, we've had some books that have gotten multiple offers from publishers, which is a great place to be. Then mm -hmm. we get decide like, Oh, what do you have to offer? <laughs> what do you have to offer? Um, but once we get the contract with the publisher, they will usually give me the date of when it's due. Um, and then I just work, 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 work. And then usually after I send in a book, most publishers within a month will turn around my edits. And then once they turn, they give me my edits, I have about a month to um, send it back. And, I, and that's really helpful because I'm writing multiple books. So I might have one book that I'm, in fact, this is what's happening right now. I have uh, one book that I turned into an editor in January 13th that I haven't got edits back in yet. I got one book that I turned into November because of the holidays. She just got it back to me a couple of weeks ago that I have edits due in about a week and a half. I have one book that I have to start because it's due, you know, this later this spring. And so it's always like this edits. I don't have to worry about that because I don't have the edits back. I have to work on these edits and I have to start this book. So it is kind of like you're working on multiple books at one time. But since my books are so varied, I mean, that's a <laughs> devotional that I turned in an Amish novel. I have edits on and a World War II novel that I have to write. They're like so different enough that mm -hmm. it's not like I get confused. <laughs> I'm not gonna have a World War II, um, you know, battle scene in my Amish book, so. <laughs> it accidentally turns out. Accidentally, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I've gotten character names. Um, all of a sudden this World War II character, the name pops up, especially if it's like similar, like the same beginning letter. So I'm like, oh wait, you're not supposed to be in this book. Let me just fix that. Usually editors will catch that too, though. Yeah. I mean, it's a whole team of people working behind the scenes after you do. Absolutely. Do and with the editors, sometimes there's multiple editors. So I'll get notes from two different people. Um, I will. Then there's there's copy editors that go over it. There's people that do layout. There's the marketing people. There's the publicity people. Um, so it is very much a team and some books depending on the publishing house like some of the larger publishing houses we will have full 
team meetings. So before a book comes out, um, especially like I did one with the winner of The Voice last year, Todd Tillman. Yes. Um, and that was a, with a big publishing house. And that book got a lot of attention. So we get in Zoom meetings with here's the editor, here's the marketing director, here's a publicist, like a couple of different publicists, here's the social media person, here's me, here's the agent, here's Todd, who's the star. And like everyone's like, we're going to do this and we're going to do this, which is great because you want a lot of people to give a lot of attention to your book because it just makes it, helps it get out there, helps it get a lot of attention. Um, and so I think a lot of people think, you know, it's just the author, we write the book and it just shows up out there. But there's a lot of people behind the scenes that put a, a work from cover design. We've had cover designs have to go back three times because it hasn't been exactly right. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot going on in the publishing process more than just, you know, writing the words and sending them in and then suddenly a book pops up. Well, and you just mentioned a book I wanted to ask about, uh, The Every Little Win. Mm-hmm. So tell us, tell us that story. This is fascinating. Okay, this is so fun. So I don't, as you can guess, I don't have a lot of time just to like watch TV. I will if my kids are watching a show with my husband in the evenings, I'll sometimes sit with them and we'll all watch the show together. Um, you know, like one 30 minute show or something, but I don't have times where I just sit and watch a lot of stuff, but I love the voice. I love that. These are ordinary people that get to, you know, use their skill and that the coaches actually like want to coach them and cheer them on and try to help them win. So just that, again, that ordinary person doing big things is kind of like a theme for me of what, which is like that show and, um, season 18, Todd Tillman was there and he was the very first one out and um, he sang four chairs turned to Blake Shelton, Kelly Clarkson, John Legend and Nick Jonas turned and everyone's like, we want you on our team. And he was a pastor from Mississippi, had only sang in church. He, him and his wife have eight kids, two by adoption. And from then I'm like, I'm voting for him all the way through. I just like was his biggest fan and my agent's also a fan and we talk about him. <laughs> so um, all the way through and then he won. And that at the day after he won, I got on Facebook and I was thinking like their story is amazing. Like he was never, he doesn't have a YouTube channel. He wasn't doing concerts. Like he was a pastor who also led worship in this tiny little church. I mean, their church is tiny. And then he wins this national competition. So I got on Facebook and like, is anyone out there? No, Todd or Brooke Tillman. And at first I was just going to interview them for my podcast. And then after my agent and I started talking, we're like, actually, I think this is a book. And so he went on a Tuesday, Wednesday, someone had already connected me with Brooke. Um, Mm -hmm. By Monday, we were on the phone with my agent. We're like, okay, let's make a book out of this. I mean, it was that quick. And I'm like, you don't know me from anybody. (laughs) So, which I'm glad they trusted me. Um, and then we, that was one of the ones that multiple publishers were interested in their story and we were able to pick a publisher and they did a fantastic job, um, with their book, but it was, see, he won in May. Um, the book was done in November and it came out the following June. So that was a fast one. Usually they take longer than that because, (laughs) um, he was popular at the time and people loved his story. They worked really hard to get it out in a very short period of time. Sure. Yeah, when the market is still ready for his story. Yeah, but usually books release an hour, uh, not an hour, a year after you turn them in. So I just turned in my book um, January 13th. It'll release next spring. And so okay. um, sometimes if you see books coming out and then people will say like, oh, there's two books kind of above the same topic. But I'm like, they're by different publishing houses. They were turned in like a year to a year and a half ago. It's not like anyone is copying anybody. Like the process is such a long process that it just happened that two people kind of had similar topics at the same time. Well, then what was your process for collaborating or for writing that story? Yeah, so it was super fun because Todd and Brooke, they're both like, we don't write. (laughs) So I, and he was right after he won, he was on the road a lot. He was doing a lot of shows. Um, he did a while he was in Pigeon Forge every week, I think for like six or eight weeks, Pigeon Forge every week. And, and literally I would call him either on zoom or on the phone and I would record it and he would just tell me stories And the story, the book, if you read it, um, half of the chapters are in Todd's voice and half of them are in Brooke's voice. Mm-hmm. Um, cause she's just an amazing, amazing person. Like the the strong person behind the scenes of him. And so it reads like 
it's Todd talking and it reads like Brooke talking. It was really those recorded interviews that I had transcribed. So their voice, their cadence, the words they say mm -hmm. are those transcribed words that made it. And so I just made the story there, um, kind of pooled in parts, you know, he, she tell me a story and I come back to him like, well, what about this time? Cause they almost got divorced within a couple of years of marriage. They had a critically ill child. Um, they've had church struggles, they're pastors for 11 years. He took over his daddy's church, which always brings like struggles because people are expecting you to be like more like your dad. And so a lot of their stories, I'd hear them from both sides. Um, and then I was able to interview his dad and talk to him yeah. and his dad was telling me the same stories. And that really just showed me like, everyone's telling me the same stories here, like from different ways, but the same yeah. stories. And so it really helped me just show that they were being truthful and authentic. And I just tried to make it their story. And I was just the person that put it into words that was able to get it out there for them. And the cool thing was that they read it for their audio book. Um, and so I bought it, even though I wrote the book, because I loved listening to them read the story in their own voices. I mean, even parts Todd sings. I talk about like his grandma singing hymns and so he'll break out in a little part of the hymn and I'm like that's so cool so um, and they're still really good friends of mine we're still we text and we you know talk our families have gotten together so my big family and their big family we've met up in Pigeon Forge and went out to dinner and took up like half of Olive Garden <laughs> when we were there we get on social media and people are like we saw you guys in Olive Garden. I'm like, no, I'm sure you heard us yeah. in Olive Garden first because I think six of our kids were there and all eight of their kids. And yeah, so that's a big space in Olive Garden. So it's fun to see like going from fangirl to actually being able to help them right. get their story out there has been really great. Wow, that is wonderful. And then, you know, he comes over and I'm like, okay, I got to sing. To, you got to give me a concert in my living room because <laughs> I wrote your book. So. So you're getting a private concert from the winner of The Voice. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So um, I know you have done other stories where you've come alongside somebody and helped tell their story. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I that I did it for Todd and Brooke, and then I also did it for um, Ora J and Irene, who are the ones that – I first interviewed uh, the Amish couple. They had they actually left the Amish, yes. um, but they had lost two daughters in a horse and buggy and semi accident. So I was able to, to kind of tell their story in their own words. Um, and and the cool thing was, um, uh, Irene had written letters to her. I think it was no, it was her mother in law. So it was Ora J's family about what they were doing in Montana and the gardens and different things. Yeah. And the mother in law had kept every one. So as I'm, because they had moved from um, Indiana to Montana, and I'm writing about this time in their life, and they gave me this huge bag of letters. And so I'm like, this is priceless because mm -hmm. not only are they telling me their story but I had their actual words of them in their garden. And one of their kids actually got burned really bad when they were doing their laundry outside. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> like this is a real Montana experience. They're doing their laundry in this huge tub. And he put, went to go put carous, or gasoline on a fire to start the fire and it caught on fire. Like, but it's all in the letters. And I'm like, this is so cool. So I was able to, it actually the book has bits and pieces of their letters. Mm -hmm. um, interspersed um, with their story. And so I did their story. And then I did um, Kristen Jane Anderson. Um, mm -hmm. She was on Oprah probably 15 years ago when Oprah actually had her TV show. But she had tried to commit suicide by laying down in front of a train. And she ended up losing her legs. Um, but it was a miracle. Like, there's no way she should have survived that. But she, I had heard a friend telling uh, a friend told me about her and after she was laying there, the train had gone over her and, and mm. stopped and she realized like she lost her legs. Mm. Um, she heard amazing grace, like playing in her mind. It was like this amazing story and just how she's overcome that. And she's in a wheelchair. And at the time we wrote the book, she wasn't married. Now she's married and has four kids. And so I'm like, okay, Kirsten, we might need to do another book um, sometime, but just how, uh, you know, our lives are worth living, even though we think there's too much. And she had had a lot of depression. Um, she'd been stalked, like 
a lot of, I'm not going to go into bad stuff. Bad mm-hmm. stuff had happened to her. And so she didn't feel life was worth living. And now she's the one that she speaks at schools. She speaks at in any events, suicide prevention events, talking about um, how life is worth living. And now she has her husband and her adorable kids. So it's really cool to go alongside people. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like kind of the veterans, I did it, but in a fictional way, this is actually more their story. And so I like to be able to, to do that and be able to help people get their story out there when they might not have the skills to be able to put it into words, but I'm able to help them do that. So as you're then collecting these stories through, you know, letters and phone conversations and, and, and meetings and do the players in these nonfiction books also sort of become like characters? Are you? Yeah, I try to write their scenes in a fictionalized way. Okay. Um, so Kristen, I mean, when she tells it, she talks about, you know, it was cold and it was dark. And um, I was sitting beside a, a tr- train tracks. So it was the day after, uh, so it was January 2nd, 2000, 2000, the year 2000. Oh, wow. um, and so she's able to sh- tell it short because she's speaking and she only has, you know, 45 minutes. But in a book, I'm able to go into more details about the cold and what she was wearing. So I do use my fiction techniques Mm -hmm. to make the scene for the readers um, so that it's not just narrative, someone reading, but they feel like it's almost a novel that they're part of the story and they get to, you know, experience. So like for Todd, I talk about, you know, going to his grandma's church as a little kid and you know the white pews and looking up and seeing the pastor's wife with her beehive hair and so i try to like put people into the scene so they're kind of part of it i'm just looking at our 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 comments on social media you've got a comment from uh, father marcus who says it's so interesting to get to hear all of your stories and we do appreciate you coming and sharing them. Do you, we talked about your upcoming book. Um, do you have anything else you want to share with us tonight? Um, well, I'm just thankful that I can come and share all these stories. You know, I think so many times as writers, um, you know, we're just working. <laughs> we know how cool the stories are. Um, yes. We know how, like, I was able to interview this person and then this happened. And so it's fun to be able to kind of share the behind the scenes. I have one really cool story that I just want to throw in there because it's yes, like do. it's really cool. So in my book, um, Arms of Deliverance, it's set in World War II in um, it's set in England and Belgium. And one of the things that is involved is Liebrens born homes, and these are the homes where um, German girls would go to have babies for the Third Reich, and babies would be born and they were going to be raised to be part of Hitler's army. Well, one one theme of the story is takes place in these homes. And so I needed to know about them. And there's only one home in Belgium that um, had these young women there during the war. And I couldn't find any information like, because it's a, it's like a rescue and escape story. I needed her to be in Belgium, but I'm like, everything was in languages. I couldn't understand. I couldn't find any information and I just don't want to make stuff up. So I, I actually prayed and I said, okay, God, you were in Belgium in 1942. Like, you can help me. And I remembered later that day that I knew someone from Belgium. I had been at a World War II reunion, and this guy named Roger was from Belgium, and he was a historian. He was interviewing the guys. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got this guy's card, so I went and found it. I emailed him. I'm like, Roger, this is so random, (laughs) but I am doing this these uh, story set in this home in this tiny little village mm-hmm. in the middle of Belgium. I can't understand anything on the websites. I can't read it. We, that was, this was before like Google translate was even like a big thing. And so I said, do you have any information? And he emailed me back and he says, yes, I grew up in this town. That place where that home was is now a museum. What do you need to know? I know the main lady, the curator of the museum, what do you need to know? And I'm like, okay, I know one person in Belgium and he was able to, he's like, this is how many rooms. This is what the grounds look like. This is how many, there's 19 women that were in there. This is what happened. And I'm like, that's amazing. So it's those types of stories. Like when you pick up a novel, you just read it. I'm like, oh, that was really cool. But I think as an author, it's so fun to be able to share like these cool things that happen behind the scenes. So I just appreciate you letting me kind of share the behind the scenes of all these books. 
Well, and I just realized I had one more thing I wanted to ask you about, and this okay. is sort of the origin of the whole thing. Will you please tell us about, about sort of your beginning of loving books? Like, how did you? Oh, yes. Love books? I can't I'm, so you, I'm so glad we talked about that. Okay, so I grew up in a non-reading home. I don't ever remember a bookshelf. I don't remember ever seeing my mom or my stepdad reading. Like there was no books in the house. But when I was about fifth grade, we moved by a library. And I was at the library all the time. I, during the summers, I would go and I would volunteer and help them shelve books. And I would uh, check tons of books out. In fact, one time I remember I had so many books in the plastic bags on my handlebar that writing down a hill I actually flipped over the handlebars and crashed and the books went everywhere because there were, I had so many books I was taking home. So truly it was that love of reading in the library. Um, I remember just going in all the Nancy Drew books, all the Little House on the Prairie books, and I loved Helen Keller. So they would get interlibrary loans and they're like, look what we have. We have another book for you. And because they knew me, I was there like all the time. Um, that they would find books for me. And I think that just really, I, don't, I wish I remember what their names were, but they were just like, the librarians were so, because I was so interested in books, they just went out of their way to find books that I would love. And so that really um, sparked that love of reading. So years later, um, I was in a church nursery and a friend's like, I'm writing a novel. And when she said that, like my insides just lit up. Like, I don't believe real people can do this, but I thought back to like, I've always loved books. I love reading. It just seemed like this is what I wanted to do with my life. So really the love of the library, the love of reading books, those librarians that poured into me. I mean, none, none, none of this would be possible if it hadn't been that early experience. Wow. And that's just rippled out to all of the, the folks that you've gotten to write for and to. Yeah. Yep. I think um, my agent and I counted up and I think I have, almost 4 million books in print, which is just, and they've been translated in like 13 languages and just, it's crazy. And I'm just here in Bryant, Arkansas, <laughs> typing away at my computer and working on books. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for coming and spending this time with us and telling us about your books and about your process and about your life. It has just been such a pleasure. Thank you, Shannon, for having me. Thank you. And and good congratulations, good job, Shannon, on, on a fantastic yes. first program. <laughs> yes, this was this was Shannon's. Uh, if you missed the beginning, this is Shannon's uh, first time on our live stream here at the library, and and you can't tell at all. Oh well, thank you. I get by with a little help from my friends, right? <laughs> so. and, and like she said, she, uh, Tr Trisha, thank you for joining us. Uh, yeah, it's, it's great to have uh, someone with your. Uh, recognition and accolades on our broadcast this evening. Yep. So, thank you for having me. Absolutely, and uh, everyone who was watching live, if you tuned in late or, or you saw the whole thing, uh, please share this broadcast, um, and and, uh, and it will also be available as a recording on both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, have a thank you from uh, Julie who is watching live. Uh, thank you for watching, Julie, and. Uh, yeah, take care, and uh, we'll have more author talks coming in the future. Hopefully, uh, Shannon will will do some more, just like this, uh, come up with some more great questions. So, take care, and thank you for watching. Thank you. Good night.